In this video, I'm tackling a huge topic, the impact of menopause and multiple sclerosis. Don't turn away because all of that starts right now. Hey. Howdy. Thanks for learning about MS with me, Aaron Boster. Multiple sclerosis is a super complex condition. It's so much more than just the interplay of the nervous system and the immune system. In today's video, I'm tackling a super important topic. That's the impact of menopause on multiple sclerosis. 30% of all people impacted by MS are women who are either perimenopausal or postmenopausal. And this is a very underappreciated topic. Get out your pen and paper and let's jump in. Let's start with some definitions. Menopause is defined as the period in time 12 months after a woman has her last menstrual cycle or period. In the years leading up to menopause, however, a woman can have changes in her menstrual cycle along with other symptoms such as hot flashes. That period of time, which normally starts around age 45 or so, is called perimenopause. Now, how is this relevant as it relates to MS? It's actually super duper relevant because as it turns out, any fluctuation in a woman's hormones has an impact on MS. This is really worth considering. Now, if we think about a woman's menstrual cycle, we can see an uptick of MS disease activity during her menstrual cycle each and every month. When a woman is pregnant and her estrogen skyrockets, we know that that can cause a decrease in MS symptoms. After a woman delivers a baby and then delivers the placenta and those super high estrogen levels fall back down, we can see a temporary uptick in MS activity. When a woman is perimenopausal and her estrogen and her progesterone starts to drop down, we can see changes that impact multiple sclerosis. And when a woman is in menopause or what we say postmenopause, we can also see changes to the disease activity. As I mentioned in the beginning, about 30% of people impacted by MS are women who are in menopause or perimenopausal. And so this is very relevant. In this video, I wanna break all of this down. I'm going to be talking to you about the biology of menopause, the symptoms of menopause, how they massively overlap with MS symptoms, and then some of the things that we can do to try to combat these changes. Let's spend a few minutes now talking about the biology of menopause and perimenopause, the hormonal changes that occur, and then what clinically manifests as a result. So there are three hormones that we need to be discussing as it relates to menopause. The first is progesterone. And progesterone starts to decrease in a woman's body maybe a decade earlier before she even starts to have perimenopausal symptoms. So around age 30, progesterone starts to go down. The next hormone, which is a really important hormone, and we'll talk a lot about later as it relates to MS, is estrogen. Estrogen tends to peak in a woman's body around age 40 and then slowly decreases thereafter. The third hormone, which you might not be as familiar with, is called the anti-malarian hormone. And this hormone is related to follicular health in the ovaries, so um, the maintain, maintenance of eggs. It peaks at 25, and then it starts to go down after the age of 25. And by the time a woman is in menopause, it's completely undetectable. So these changes are starting earlier in a woman's life, and they start to manifest typically when a woman enters this perimenopausal phase, probably around age 45 or so. And there's a lot of clinically relevant things that change in a woman. I'm gonna go through them with you right now. And I want you to be thinking about how almost every single one of them that I talk about is also something that we grapple with in the setting of multiple sclerosis. So what are they? Number one is fatigue and changes to sleep. And so when a woman is going through menopause, she can have an increase in fatigue and she can have difficulty with sleep. Number two is depression we can see an uptick of mood disorders and depression in the setting of perimenopause and menopause. Number three is cognitive fog and difficulty with thinking and processing. And this is another thing that we can see in the healthy population as women go through menopause. It doesn't stop there because unfortunately the down there's can be affected in menopause. 
not just new difficulties in the bedroom and vaginal dryness and things like that, but we can also see difficulty with bladder function. Ah! As my mentor used to say, sometimes nature is a little too generous. Lastly, I wanna call out that during perimenopause and menopause, this can have an impact on bone health and it can make bones more brittle and increase the risks of osteoporosis, osteopenia, etc. Real quick before we go on, if you like this video, would you please give it a thumbs up? Also, if you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please consider doing so. Those two actions teach the YouTube algorithm that you like the content and help push it out so more people impacted by MS can benefit. Thank you. So with that background, now let's focus our attention on the effect of menopause in those dropping hormones on multiple sclerosis. So there's a lot of research on this and there isn't a 100% consensus, but I've recently reviewed all the research for you so that you don't have to. And my takeaways are this, during perimenopause and into menopause, we see an uptick of MS disease progression. In other words, we can see a faster progression of disease compared to before a woman goes through menopause. Now, it's well documented that women have a slower progression of neurological disability in MS as compared to men, or otherwise put, men get worse faster than women. But at the age of around 50, that benefit to women stops, and that's probably related to going through menopause. Some of the research would suggest that women that are in a perimenopausal or menopausal state have less attacks, although I think that comment is a little less well supported. Taking that into consideration and adding insult to injury, all of the overlapping symptoms that you can see with menopause and MS, the bowel, bladder, the sexual dysfunction, the fatigue, the depression, the cog fog, the difficulty with bone health, really you can see how this is such an important topic to be aware of and how to tackle. And so, is it all gloom and doom? And when you go through perimenopause, everything's doomed to be worse? Absolutely not. There are a host of things that we can do to try to ameliorate the situation. And I'm gonna spend the next section talking about exactly that. What do we do to fight back? Well, first of all, it's important to know that this is a thing. I have heard way too often women be told by doctors, nah, -uh, that there's no relationship. And I hope that I've helped empower you and educate you that that's simply not the case. The second thing is, there are several interventions that we can participate in to help make things much better. The first that I wanna talk about is hormone replacement therapy. So hormone replacement therapy is when you take estrogen and sometimes estrogen and progesterone into the human body. And this can help with many different symptoms of perimenopause and menopause. For example, things like hot flashes uh, and things of that sort but it can also help with many of those symptoms that I listed earlier. For example, it can help improve bone health. It can help improve cognition. Allow me to repeat, hormone replacement therapy can help with cognition. It can help with fatigue and with sleep dysfunction. It can help with the down there's quite a bit. And in the setting of multiple sclerosis, it looks like when I review the studies that hormone replacement therapy can help slow down the disability associated with dropping estrogen levels and with the perimenopausal or menopausal state. Now, nothing is without risk. And in the general population, we typically don't recommend that all women receive hormone replacement therapy. Why? One is an increased risk of breast cancer, particularly if you're giving estrogen along with progesterone. The second is a risk of blood clots. Now, the blood clots might be mitigated if you're using a patch as opposed to oral medicine. But what I really wanna stress here is, this needs to be a conversation between the human, the neurologist, and the obstetrician gynecologist. And there needs to be a robust conversation because what we really have to do is weigh the risk benefit. I'm of the opinion that women impacted by MS who are going through perimenopause or are menopausal and who have these uptick of symptoms probably deserve to be considered being placed on hormone replacement therapy. And there's mitigating strategies that you can talk to your neurologist and obstetrician about trying to figure out how to do that exact risk benefit balance. 
Another very helpful treatment is the off-label use of SSRI antidepressants. And so placing a perimenopausal woman with MS on SSRIs can be very helpful to many symptoms, including, of course, depression, but also fatigue and sleep and cognitive impairment. And so that's definitely something that I think that we should be thinking about. When you consider bone health, there are outstanding medicines to beef up the bones. We can take calcium. We can take vitamin D to help push the calcium in the bones. We can take vitamin K2 to help the vitamin D help the calcium get into the bones. And there are other medicines like bisphosphonates, like Fosamax or Prolia is a medicine that can be given. And this can help strengthen up the bones as well. All people, men and women actually, over the age of 50 who have MS should have a bone DEXA scan every couple years so that we can monitor bone health. And if they're getting thin bones, osteopenia, or really thin bones, osteoporosis, we definitely want to intervene. Activities such as stomping the ground by walking or weightlifting can also help reactive bone growth. My point here is we're not just going to say, oh no, the bones, we're going to do some things about it. Now, what about the down there's? There's a lot that we can do with the down there's. If we're not able to take systemic hormone replacement therapy, estrogen cream, smearing it on the down there's can massively help with vaginal dryness and other symptoms that can affect the bedroom. And that can be a very useful tool. We can use bladder medications to help with bladder symptoms. I do want to caution the use of anticholinergics like Detrol and Ditropan just because those medicines can also cause some cognitive impairment. And so there are other options that we may consider. Medicines like Merbetric, for example, I've had great success with. Benefits to the down there's don't stop there. There's more that we can do. For example, bladder Botox is awesome sauce for helping manage the bladder. And my favorite is pelvic floor physical therapy. Pelvic floor PT is amazing and it helps with bowel, bladder, and bedroom. The pelvic floor are a bunch of muscles and they can become deconditioned. And when working with pelvic floor physical therapists, I have seen amazing results. My favorite story with pelvic floor PT was actually the very first woman that I referred to be seen by one. After spending a couple weeks or maybe a month or two in training, she sent me a fantastic text and it read, Dr. B, thank you so much for sending me to the pelvic floor physical therapist. Sex is no longer painful, but more importantly, I'm pretty sure that I can now crush beer cans with my lady parts. I love that. I am of the opinion that knowledge is powerful. And it's my hope that through this video, I've helped sensitize you to the biology of perimenopausal state and menopause, the symptoms that overlap with multiple sclerosis, and how it can negatively impact the disease course of MS by making things get worse faster. But more importantly, I hope that I've energized you and educated you and empowered you, sharing information that we can use to combat those issues. I want you to talk to your neurologist and your gynecologist about hormone replacement therapy. I want you to be very aggressive in your bone health and in symptomatic management for fatigue, for cog fog, for depression, for bowel, bladder, and bedroom concerns. My name's Aaron Boster, and as always, thank you for learning about MS with me. The biggest thing that you could do to help this channel grow is to watch another video. So please click the video that's on your screen right now. And until my next Monday morning video or my monthly live stream, or even better yet, the next time I see you at the Boster Center for MS, this is Aaron Boster saying be safe and take care.